Hello and welcome to the Now Spending Magazine podcast with me, Phil Aston. And on this episode, I'm absolutely delighted to have with me Steve Mann, guitarist, keyboard player, record producer and engineer. And Steve has played with bands like Liar, Titan, Michael Schenker, The Sweet and Lionheart. And currently um, we're looking at the launch of a brand new Lionheart album, which is absolutely superb which is called um, The Grace of a Dragonfly, which I think is released on the 23rd of February. Is that correct? Uh, exactly. 23rd of February comes out on uh, comes out worldwide on Metalville Records. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the, the great introduction, by the way. That's it's okay. great to be here, Phil. No, thank you. Now, for a lot of people, I'm put this into context because the album is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. But Lionheart aren't a new band. You've been around for a while. In fact... I've been a fan for a while. Oh, uh, you're the one that bought it. Yes, yes. <laughs> <I am. laughs> uh, from 1984, but I, I I was going through my record 1984. collection. 1984. 1984, wasn't it? I was trying to think, what else have I got in my record collection that might be connected to you? And I found um, Set the World on Fire by Liar. Yeah, that's connected to me. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> so that, that was 1978. So, you know, that's so the year that... The first Van Halen album came out and it was before the new wave of British heavy metal. And it's when hard rock was kind of struggling to get seen amongst all the mm. new wave and punk stuff. Mm. And then just literally 24 months later, the new wave of British heavy metal arrived when rock music and heavy metal suddenly became kind of fashionable. Mm -hmm. And all the major labels were looking around to think, well, maybe we should have some of that. We've got heavy metal records and neat records, etc. And... Which brings me to just prior to Lionheart was yes. Titan, yes, and uh, which is which is a great which was a great band, um, yes. So, but Lionheart had had started to come together in 1980, hadn't they? When Dennis had left uh, Iron Maiden, is that about right? Uh, that's right. Uh, Dennis left Iron Maiden, I think, late 1980, um, and that was around about the same time that Jess Cox um, departed. From Tigers. the Tigers of Pantone. And uh <clears throat> excuse me. And Jess contacted Dennis and said, Look, you know, we're both at a uh, at a loose end. Why don't we get together and form a new band? Jess had kept my telephone number from an audition I did for the Tigers of Pantang when they were looking for a, another guitar player, which John Sykes got the gig. I came second, Jess kept my number, and then when he left Tigers. He gave me a call and asked me if I was interested in um, in this new project they were putting together, um, which had no name at the time. And Jeff uh, Barton, I think it was, was um, doing an interview with uh, Dennis and Jess. And the first question he asked is, what's the name of the band? <laughs> and they hadn't a clue. And they made it up. They looked at each other and made it up on the spot. <laughs> uh, and went, Lionheart? And it kind of stuck uh, ever since. And that's how the band first came together. Because the other thing that's interesting, around that time, 1980, 1984, bands were being signed up left, right and centre, but the gestation period for Lionheart was literally four years mm. you know, before you got the, the first, mm. you know, deal. Um, was that, that was, I think that was quite unusual in a way, because many bands like, you know, the Saxons and Samsons and Def Leppards and everyone were racing out of the traps. Yes. It, it took quite a while for Lionheart to, to get that deal. Yeah, it did. I think... Um, we kind of missed it by a year uh, as far as the record companies were concerned. And uh, I don't think we realised it at the time because nobody really knew that the new wave of British heavy metal was a movement. Um, and it's kind of, it's revered these days, but back then it was just, you know, a term that sounds had come up with for, um, uh, for, for the movement. Um, but I think bands like Samson and Iron Maiden, uh, Def Leppard, they were all around uh, already around 1979. That's true. Yeah. Um, and it was late 1980 that we got together. And I think by that point, probably the record companies who were kind of all wanting a, a slice of the new wave of British heavy metal had done their signing already. And, you know, Maiden obviously were one of the first to get signed. Um, and, you know, um, I can't remember who else got signed at the time. But Prey Mantis were another one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think they all, they all just edged in there first. Um, and by the time we got uh, Lionheart together, we were then the kind of uh, the second wave, if you like, and we were then termed the first new wave of British heavy metal supergroup because of the link up between Jess and um, and Dennis. Uh, these two bands that were big at the, in the scene at the time 
Tigers and Iron Maiden. Um, and so we became the first super group, but that didn't help as far as looking for a record contract was concerned. And we didn't land a record contract in the UK anyway. Um, it was 1984 before our, our new manager at the time went out to America and he then got us a deal with CBS. So we never really kind of did anything in the UK as far as um, signing a deal was concerned. The the other thing, because I, I, cause I remember... Um, at the time, it's 1984, we'd had everyone looking towards the UK for all the, the new wave of British heavy metal. Mm. And then as we entered, moved towards the mid 80s, this, this whole movement of melodic rock, AOR, as was the other term that was bandied mm. around, started to really take off, you know, really great choruses, pre choruses, soaring guitar solos. Mm. And I remember a lot of my friends always going to the import racks at Virgin and looking for something that came from the States. Because that right. was where it all seemed to come from, you know, um, the Bon Jovi's and all these bands, Rats yeah. and Dockens, when actually it was hiding in plain sight in the UK with a Lionheart album. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was indeed. I mean, you know, we 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 were kind of quite famously known for our love of harmonies and um, uh, a, a melody and and good songs. Um, you know, and it just so happened. I mean, Dennis and I have always been very similar in that in that sense. We've liked the same guitar players. We've we've you know grew up with Wishbone Ash and bands like this with the guitar, guitar harmonies, uh, a little bit of Thin Lizzy maybe, um, and also the big choruses. You know, we love bands like like Kansas. You know, who carry on my way with some those yeah, brilliant. amazing three part harmonies, and um, and I I've got a. a, a a very uh, musical kind of technical um, background uh, with music theory. So I knew all of the kind of little intricacies that you could do with, with harmonies rather than just experimenting, which a lot of other bands were doing. Um, and so I could actually score out the harmonies for us. And we were very lucky in that uh, Rocky Newton, the bass player, had a very high voice. Dennis had a very powerful mid-range voice. Uh, and I had a low voice, low range voice. And the three voices just fitted in their, their ranges very, very well with each other. Uh, and so <clears throat> we fell on our feet there uh, to the point where a lot of other bands were asking us to, um, to do backing vocals on their albums too. I mean, I think the most famous is Def Leppard uh, with Rocky. Um, and we did Saxon, uh, we did Bronze. Um, we did a lot of sessions back then because <clears throat> we were known for those harmonies. But yeah, as you say, that really was the Lionheart sound. Um, you know, but no record company wanted that, you know, in, in the UK at the time, um, which was very, you know, real shame for us. It was indeed, wasn't it? Because in America, that's exactly what was taking off and Absolutely. becoming, yeah. you know, and obviously, and it's great to know that Rock Candy Records re-released your first album on CD. But of course, their their whole um, approach to releases is all American AOR, harmony-driven music. Mm. Now, you mentioned just that um, you were able to score the music because I know that you started mm. off um, on being classically trained on piano, didn't you? Yes, that's right. So that, in a way, set you apart from a lot of the, you know, self-taught musicians mm. in, in that in the rock arena. Has that, has that been like your, not so much a secret weapon, but something that's really helped you at, in your career? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I mean, it helped me a lot when I was... Um, first becoming established as a producer back in the, the late 1980s and, and right the way through the 1990s. <clears throat> and um, bands would often come in and they'd be doing guitar harmonies or uh, vocal harmonies. And uh, I would just, I could listen, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Right. I could listen to what they were doing uh, and just make a suggestion. Maybe you should just, you know, change this note here or that note there. And uh, <clears throat> so I became kind of quite, I suppose, earned a lot of respect. Uh, for being able to do that and being able to correct them and, you know, and then say, look, you know, you, you know that you're going unison there where you can keep it in harmony. Um, I did, it worked the other way around as well, because sometimes I went through a period where I was too correct. And I had a, a band come in one time and they were singing this chorus that to my ears just sounded atonal. Yeah. And I said, no, no, I said, you want to correct that. You know, you want to make it nice and, you know, sweet and all the harmonies working. And they said, well, we'll try it your way, um, but we're not convinced. And uh, they tried it my way and went back to their way. And, and I listened to what they did. And I thought, actually, that atonality is a part of the sound. Um, so I learned at the same time to actually loosen up a little bit and, and not 
you know, say, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, everything has to be exactly according to music theory. You know, I mean, composers like Thomas Tallis would throw in a, a completely um, weird chord somewhere just because he could. You know, it, it kind of makes you pay attention a bit. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, and uh, as Lionheart, it didn't go the way you, you planned. You then spent some time with Michael Schenker, who you, you've mm. continued to work with to this day, haven't you? That's right, yeah. Yeah. So how, how, how did you find uh, Schenker to work with and what's that been like for you? Um, I think I've been one of the lucky ones. <laughs> when, I, when I joined in 86, um, that he would really got himself together and he was um, not drinking and... Um, and when he's in that state, his his focus is is unbelievable. I mean, he has this routine of practicing so many hours every single day. Right. He has to do certain scales. Then he has a a period of exploration. Um, he has a term for it. I've forgotten what it is. But where he just tries out different ideas, and if there's something that he likes, he will record it, listen back, and think that no, that's good, and include it in his list of riffs. Um, so I. When I was working with him, uh, I I caught him at that really, really good time. Um, he had his bad moments before I joined and he had his bad moments after I left. Uh, and there were a couple of moments where he, you know, was yeah. a bit strange, you know, but but basically he was uh, completely together. Uh, and then when I got a call from him in 2016 to form Michael Schenker Fest, or he was yeah. forming Michael Schenker Fest and asked me to, to be a part of it, um, by that point, he's he was completely and utterly together. He'd gone into this third phase of his life, as he would call it, and um, and he's been great ever since, you know. And I've just noticed somehow that as time goes on, he mellows out and he becomes warmer and warmer. And um, you know, he would do things like you know hug you when you see him, which he never ever did back in the eighties. And yeah. he's become a really great person. And and of course, he is you know certainly one of the world's best guitarists, if not the world's best guitarist, and certainly the most melodic. Absolutely. That's a very, very good point. His guitar mm. lines have always been very melodic, no matter what kind of, um, how fast his approach was to guitar playing. It was always melody driven, wasn't it? Yeah. And, so exactly. obviously, and, and, and still and still is. Yeah. As is, of course, yours. Uh, and it's just, we'll just move forwards to the new album now, The Grace of a Dragonfly. Um, this is, a st stupendous album and i feel that we've talked about you know in the mid 80s when uh aor and this kind of melodic rock was although it was its time it, mm. it all the eyes were on america yes whereas i feel like in the last 12 months or so i've had i've spoken to bands like vega nitrate heat eclipse cats in space tempt mm. and, and a lot of it seems to be coming out of places like sweden but there seems to be an upsurge you know in this kind of a return to this harmony driven Mm. melodic uplifting mm. um and I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing that word because we live in dark times and and this music is so uplifting now i'll do that as a bit of a preamble because your new album is a concept album about world war ii mm. but it's an anti-war album isn't it it's actually very very positive in its approach so how mm. did this concept come about rather than just like a selection of tracks um when we finished um the reality of miracles, um, and we'd done our marketing for it and our promo stuff. Um, we then started to. Well, I, I said, let's get on with a new album. Um, I'm not one of those people that kind of you know looks back and goes, oh, well, that was great. This was great. I like to kind of push on. Yeah. And um, I was thinking to myself, how can we actually take a step forward and do something a little bit different? And I loved all of those old uh, concept albums, you know, from the 70s and the 80s, and. You know, especially things like War of the Worlds from Jeff Wayne. Jeff Wayne, yeah. One yeah, of my great. absolute favourite albums of all time. And I just thought, you know, maybe we could do a concept. And I talked to Lee, obviously, as as the lyricist. Uh, he has the main input as to, you know, what he he writes about. And I said, you know, what, what do you think then, Lee? And he's got this fascination for World War II. It, it's a healthy fascination. It's not a morbid fascination, <laughs> I hasten to add. Um, and, uh, and he said... Yeah, mate, I'd love to do uh, this, you know, a concept about World War II. And that's how that came about. But I said to him, Lee, we, we have to make sure, you know, any hint of jingoism out. You know, we, we don't want that. We don't want, you know, hooray, we're the allies. We want the yeah, war, yeah, we're yeah. blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, because that's very distasteful. Um, we, we wanted to respect and remember um, the people who fought 
for our liberty, of course. And my father was one of them. And we're all of that age where I think our, you know, we have direct links to people who, um, who were involved in the war. Um, but I said, it has to be a, uh, an anti-war album. And Lee had this great approach of making it very humane. So the songs were very much about the people, you know, the innocent people who were caught up in all of this, who were conscripted, who were sent to the front line. Um, and he wrote little stories, you know, about individual people. Um, and I thought that was a really great approach, a really great way to go. And every song has a kind of almost a little twist and a, and a little positive touch to it. Uh, Lee's a very, very positive person. And, you know, so that comes naturally for him. And that fulfilled my requirement of making the album uh, positive. You, you made a very, very good point, Phil, that we, we do live in dark times. You know, I think people are very aware of that. And if our music can make people listen to the album and then come out feeling a little bit more positive and thinking, oh, yeah, now I feel better, um, then we have achieved what we set out to do. And I played it to a kind of select group of people from kind of all different areas and countries. Yeah. And um, always that's the, the feedback I've been getting is that after I've listened to the album, I feel very positive. And, and that for me is is a fantastic thing. It really is. I think that's one of the most important things now. And as I've been uh, running Now Spinning Magazine and talking to people and and on, on the YouTube channel, on the website mm. as well, is that people want something that lifts them up. And I mm. think you know, a lot of people know, I think you, music is like a doctor or a healer. You can, what you put on in the morning changes the atmosphere, the room that you're in changes yeah. how you feel. Mm. And I think that's what's, a, that's what's a good about this kind of music. And mm. especially as, as you constructed the songs where that great thing about melodic rock or this kind of music where you know it's the verse. The verse can almost be a chorus. And then mm. it goes into the pre-chorus and it builds again, it lifts up again, and you know the chorus is coming. And when the chorus is coming, you think, oh, wow. And <laughs> these, these tracks have that. And then, of course, you've still got the middle eight to, to look forward to. <laughs> but the, one of my favourite tracks is The Longest Night. Um, oh, yeah. it's, I think it's just yeah. fantastic. But And that yeah. those two guitar, the guitar solos, the two, you know, where you yes. take turns in taking the lead. Yes. But that must have been a lot of fun to do. Were you together when you did that or was it done separately no we did that separately um yeah. you know it's it's really kind of budget reasons more than anything else i mean if we could afford to jump on a plane and you know get course, Dennis yeah. over to my studio it would, would be great um you know but we thought well for the sake of just two or three guitar solos yeah is it really worth it you know and um on on second nature the guys flew over yeah and we were together for that for that album for a lot of the overdubs um the reality of miracles we weren't able to because that was during COVID time. And so we had to do things over the internet, uh, but it worked really well. You know, we were very happy with the way that album came out and we thought, well, should we spend money on flights and hotels yeah, or should true. we actually save the money and spend it on something else? And, you know, we, we thought we'll, we'll save it. And we worked very well over the internet. And, um, but yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. And I think for the next album, We'll do a lot more of that. That's that swapping of guitar solos, because it's very traditional lion hearts. And, and when I listened back to this album once it was mixed and mastered, I thought there's probably not enough of that, you know. And a few people have come back and said the longest night was their favourite track, uh, if for no other reason. And they loved that switching of the guitar yeah. solo, and then the, the double solo at the end. And we used to do a lot more of that. And I think that's something that maybe is missing a little bit from this album, but. Uh, I promise I'll make up for it on the next album. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it works so well, and of course, it gives you a lot of room that when if you play that track live, you could just keep you could just double that. Absolutely, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, we we could just keep going as long as we want to, and as long as the audience are into it, you know, and then have a cue to to go into the the harmonies at the end. So, um, um, the, the other track, uh, "Just a Man," which is kind of more of a ballad, um, is is a beautiful song, mm -hmm. and it kind of felt like it was. Well, to me, joined at the hip to the reality of miracles. That song that you did for the charity, um, you know that. that oh yes. Um, <laughs> uh, do, uh, do you mean uh, that was Mary? Did you know? Which yes, was that's the, the one. Yes, that one. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah sure. Uh, uh, that's. Just, I mean, can you just say a little bit about that that song? And because you raised quite a bit of money for that for that charity, and it's a, it's such a beautiful song and and a lovely thing to yeah. to have done. Yeah. Um, 
We ju- we just felt. I mean, Dennis is very very deeply involved in um, in charity work, uh, and, and we all kind of contribute as much as we can. And I just thought maybe we should do something as um, uh, as a band. Um, so I think the. I mean, I heard I heard this song because my son did a version of it. Uh, Mary, did you know? And yeah. uh, and I, I really I just loved the lyrics. I, I loved everything about the song, you know. And I just thought this actually would lend itself to having a, a slightly kind of rocked up version. Um, and because it was not our song, and because it was a kind of obvious, very obvious Christmas song, I thought, you know, let let's use this as a way of of raising money. Um, one of our team, a guy called Nigel Hart, um, is does a lot of charity work for a hospice a children's hospice yeah um and it's uh it's it's a palliative hospital so they're 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 basically terminally terminally ill children and uh and when we're thinking of which charity we're going to support we thought well you know that seems like the obvious one um and like any charity i mean they're crying out for donations and uh, so we were able to raise quite a bit of money for them and um and i think the three other guys with nigel um, actually went to the hospice and then presented them with the check, which was which was nice. When, when I was is a it, just to kind of uh, point out the poignancy of that. I mean, when we're putting the video together, we asked the the um, uh, what was it called Little uh, Little Havens. We asked yeah. Little Havens if they had some uh, some footage that we could use, you know, with the parents' permission, and they gave us some footage, and we put it into the video, and um, and when the video came out, I sent it to them to approve and they, they asked for one shot to be taken out because a little girl had died. And it was very tough. It was really tough. I can imagine, yeah. But it, yeah. it made us even more determined. Sorry. No, no, I I, I understand I understand and I think as as mm. as musicians, creative people, our, our skin is like paper thin. Mm. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're writing music or you're putting out songs that are coming from the heart. You're not making widgets yeah. in a factory. No, and exactly. so that you're, you, 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 anything like this, the more mm. open you are, the more you feel. You yeah, know? So, exactly. I mean, yeah. I think that when I, when I watched the video, you know, that mm. it made me feel like that before you even told me that. Tale. Yeah, no, right. you know? yeah. So it's a beautiful, a beautiful song and a, and a wonderful Thank thing you. to have done. Yeah, no, so, we were very happy to have been able to raise, you know, it, uh, so much money for them. No, no, it's such a mm. such a wonderful story mm. and obviously unsung. Another track going back to the new album I really love, and again, it's because of all the glorious harmonies, is UXB. Right. UXB is, oh. <laughs> is wonderful. Yeah, that's <laughs> – it's funny because – it's very interesting with this album because whenever I do interviews and people tell me what their favorite track is, it's always a different track. <laughs> and you're the first one that's good. On, on UXP, which, which is great. You know, I mean, we, uh, as a producer, I'm always kind of very um, uh, strong on the fact that we have no fillers. You know, I don't want to kind of just put in a, a song from somewhere, you know, that's just a bunch of chords just so that we make up the time of the album. I'd rather do a shorter album. And, um, so, you know, we, yeah, it's, it's great that you say that because uh, I think that's Lee's favourite song as well. I think he was very happy with the way that, that came out. Um, so I think, yeah, every, every song on the album is, is actually very, very strong. Do you, do, you think, do you think because you approach it as a concept with a story, mm. that meant that the songs were stronger because you, you haven't got some, oh, we just need two more tracks and, and, and it, not that anyone would approach an album like that, but you know, but everything has to be part of the the story. So each each component has got to be mm. as strong as each other, hasn't it? Whereas just a song about various things, which is why you do get some albums with a track that's not quite as good as the opening one or whatever. Mm. Mm. I mean, that definitely helps. I mean, having the having the theme to write to because the the way Lee and I write together is I write the backing track, send it to Lee, and then he comes up with his ideas. And sends them back, and we it kind of goes backwards and forwards a couple of times, and then we end up with the song. You always know when the song's working, you know, because it's um, when Lee sends it back, and I listen to what he's done. I think, oh yeah, that's 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 great, and that gives me ideas, and I kind of put in a few different chords or extend the bridge a bit, you know, maybe only the first time or whatever. Um, If you're struggling uh, and you're trying to make a song sound good, then we just throw it out. You know, we we don't. We don't pursue it because it's just not worth it. I've never, 
uh, or very rarely actually had a song where I've been struggling to get it to sound good and then it's ended up as a good song. Um, so we just cut our losses. If it's, you know, it doesn't matter who's written that everybody in the band is of the same mind that we just want an album full of great songs. And every song that's on the album, we felt really, really positive about and really strong about. But it does help when you have a theme. And I was I was quite surprised with that because it's, it's the first uh, concept or theme album that I've ever worked on. Hmm. And um, and it really actually did, did help. You know, I had this thing in my head about, uh, you know, I guess I had a few images of uh, World War II in my head. And I think that just kind of helped me in terms of how I put the backing track together and certainly how, how Lee wrote the lyrics over the top. Yeah, that that's interesting because if you're if you're writing a song about love or whatever, and the vocalist has obviously put, come up with the lyrics, mm. you're writing the music. But in this case, because the lyrics are so descriptive and almost mm. theatrical in the way that they've been, that they're, they're describing um, an image, aren't they? Mm. More than not just um, words. So, did that mean when you were, when you were putting the music together, you were thinking in that way? You, you were thinking more deeply than you would if it was a song about boy meets girl. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, it really kind of does does make a difference to to the the whole writing process. I knew also that the the whole subject was very very close to Lee's heart, so he was really having a field day just churning out all of these <laughs> these lyrics. Um, I mean, I've always said with Lee's lyrics, they are very big and bold and very picturesque and very colourful. Um, you know, which is what you were saying. Uh, and that's why I love them, you know, because they are poetic, but they're, I don't know, they're just big. They're big lyrics. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the only way I can describe it. And um, and so because this subject was so close to his heart and he was had the opportunity to, uh, to express things uh, in the way I think he's always wanted to, then, of course, that that really, really helped uh in the in the way the songs came out, so so definitely, I mean, I think you know to the point where we would certainly think about doing a themed album or concept album again in the future. And incidentally, um, the uh, the song that comes out, the single that comes out tomorrow, V is for Victory, uh, the video to it, um, a lot of the stuff that's in the video is Lee's house, and he has this room <laughs> which is just full of World War II memorabilia. Wow. And, and a lot of it is in this video. So if you check out the video oh, tomorrow. Yeah, will do, yeah. yeah. Uh, you'll see how how um, uh, how obsessed he is. <laughs> wow. And uh, the album is bookended by two great tracks, obviously Declaration, which mm. has a kind of UFO love to love vibe at the very at the start, which yeah. is Nothing wrong with that at all, yeah. uh, which is a great track. And then, of course, poignant ending, that yeah. short, literally just over 60 second, almost mm. like floats across the pond into saying, mm. you know, peace, bring peace into the world as a mm. complete antidote of what the, you know, about the war. Mm. I mean, it's a wonderful message. And that's why I, I do I do agree with you. It's totally positive um, mm. experience listening to this. Mm. Well, Declaration, um, originally over that long intro, um, had uh, Chamberlain's, uh, was, was it Neville Chamberlain? I think it well, was. The yeah. speech, yeah. Um, yeah, the speech uh, where, where uh, Germany invaded Poland and then he said, you know, we're now in a state of war. And it fitted absolutely perfectly. But for me, it was too British. You know, I, I, I really wanted the album to... Uh, you know, because obviously we have markets in Germany and Japan and, and it, it could be uh, a little sensitive, especially, I think, in Japan. And so I didn't want it to be, you know, the, the establish the album at the very beginning as being this is, you know, a British war, because uh, I didn't think that was quite right. So even though it sounded so good, um, I, I left it out. You know, I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't put that in. Um and so it became more more generic, uh, that song, which I think was kind of quite important. Um, uh, yeah, so I totally that, agree. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, you know, declaration obviously was the start of the war was was actually the the declaration of war by Chamberlain, and then uh, I think halfway through the album, I I said to Lee, we need just a short statement at the end, just to put our point of view across. I said, if I write something on piano, you know, one minute long, that's all it needs to be. Um, can you write a melody to it? And he did. And he came back with his melody and his melody started low and built up and up and up and up. And I thought, I can't just have had this with piano. So <laughs> I thought, let's, we'll get the London Symphony Orchestra in and we'll record them. And uh, <laughs> 
no, I mean, I, I, I kind of did the the orchestrate the big orchestration bit on that, and um, uh, and just finished with a kind of yeah, we just wanted to to end the the album in a very very positive way, and that's the, the most positive way we could think of. Uh, I, totally, and I think as you say, taking off Chamberlain's um, speech is good because there are so many different conflicts in the world that the yeah. listening to this album. I know obviously it's about World War Two, but actually mm. it just works with any. It just works with anything that's going on around yeah, us that, at the moment, and that's really important. I mean, that's that's especially obviously you know since we started the album, the U- Ukraine war started, the, yeah. the Gaza war has started, you know, and so I think it's very to keep the album really relevant. I think it's kind of important that you know we didn't keep referring back to you know yeah. the British or how you know how the British yeah. behave in the war. Um, I mean, that was obviously a kind of a, a, a direction that Lee was going in, but um, I was kind of trying to pull it away from that a little bit. I think we've kind of uh, found a good compromise there. Yes, because I think it will be, as you say, it will appeal to people from wherever they are in the world. Yeah, so the album's awesome. out on the 23rd of Feb. I, I, do you have any plans to, to tour it as a as a band? Well, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, we uh, the, the problem previously has been all of us are involved in different projects, uh, and obviously, I'm with Michael Schenker, and yeah. you know, every year we've done a you know American tours, European tours, UK tours, um, and a whole load of festivals. So it's been very difficult to actually find a slot for Lionheart to to tour yeah. at all. This year, uh, the touring is seems to be very light. Um, not quite sure why, but anyway, we're we're doing I think two festivals, and that's that's it. There will be some other stuff come in for sure. But um, and at the moment, it's looking kind of fairly lightweight. And it's the same with the other guys. So we're hoping that actually this year we're, we're going to be able to get some touring in. We're playing uh, Firefest in yep. October, on the 11th of October. Brilliant. Um, we're going to try and get some warm updates around that time as well. But uh, if we can get some um, some touring in this year, then that would be fantastic. It'd be really good. Fantastic. And so the best place people to get their album or do any pre-orders, is that from lionheartrock.com or from? Uh, there mm-hmm. is a, there's a pre-order link and yeah. I'm, we're putting that on all of the posts. So okay. if they go to, you know, um, not Instagram, but. Uh, I'll find it. And I'll yeah, stick it's, it's yeah. On all the yeah. Facebook posts, yeah. it's all, uh, the, the pre-order link is there. So um, yeah, you can order it from there. But you can do the usual. Go to Amazon; they they have it too. You know, so it's um, so it's entire, it'll be available everywhere, and it's coming out on CD and silver vinyl. Wow! Uh, and the silver vinyl looks very very nice. Uh, the other thing is, uh, buy it. Don't stream it, or you can stream it as well. But as long as you buy it, um, do because the artwork from Tristan Greatrex is absolutely stunning. It is just. He's done all of our albums so far from Second Nature onwards. Um, and I think he's really, really excelled himself on this one. It's it's just fantastic. So uh, buy the album and you'll get the artwork too. Yeah, I mean, as I always say to, I mean, most of Nice Penny Magazine listeners buy physical product anyway, but stream to discover and uh, to see what it's like, but always buy the physical album to support the artist and not just support the artist, to actually feel closer to the music and the creative process as well. And especially um, with an album like this, with a story, a concept, mm. you know, having that in front of you, as you say. I mean, you're obviously like me from the, the golden age of vinyl. Um, mm. So seeing it come back as it has and releasing the album on silver doubles, gatefold silver vinyl, mm. um, how, how does that feel? I mean, you know, to yourself, are you it's a proud moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I haven't got a parry they're putting. I think our record company, Metalville, are putting the albums in the post today. Uh, so because okay. I got a, an email yesterday saying, where should we send them to? So that's a good sign. So that's hopefully sign. I'll, um, I'll get that in the next two or three days or so. Uh, but uh, Tristan makes mock-ups yeah. um, of what the album looks like. And from the mock-up alone, uh, it just looks stunning. And I just oh, know that, that when I take the album out uh, and open up the the booklet or the, the the inserts it's just going to be stunning and tristan does is a is a is a real genius tristan i have to i can't sing his praises enough 
he does what's called a circle of bands. Um, and he takes, and every time a new album comes out, he says, you've got to tell me what other projects you've done, who you've played yeah. with. Um, and he does his circle of bands where every one of us is on this big pull-out <laughs> sheet. And there's lines going all over the place oh, wow. and, you know, linking up with, you know, Rocky and I will be in yeah. the Paul Singer group and oh. MSG. And yeah. it's inc- I, I don't know how he does it, um, but it's an absolute total work of art. So it's, um, it's the kind of thing you could frame and stick up on your wall. In fact, maybe I will. So it's, well, you've sold it to me. Uh, <laughs> and the, mu- the music's fantastic anyway. Oh, I so- you should be a salesman. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for your time this afternoon. And uh, everybody, this album is just absolutely brilliant. And as Steve says, get a copy. Um, it's a brilliant co- concept. It's so uplifting and so uh, a glorious harmonies, guitar playing. Can't fault it. Absolutely yeah. brilliant album. So thanks, Steve. And uh, good luck with the gigs and um, stay in touch. And I'll hopefully talk to you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Phil. It's been great to talk to you. And I do hope we can we can do it all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks very much. A huge thank you to my guest, Steve Mann from Lionheart. The album, The Grace of a Dragonfly, is released worldwide on February the 23rd. It's available on CD and double vinyl. Stream it to see what you think of it, but please buy the physical copy to help support the band, but also get closer to the music and the creative process from the artist. This is a wonderful, positive joyous and uplifting album this kind of melodic rock is just amazing and it's just some fantastic harmonies great guitar playing it's just highly recommended thank you for watching thank you for being here please subscribe to the podcast please visit the website at nowspinning.co.uk the facebook group which is a great place for collectors to hang out and the youtube channel with lots of reviews and updates and lots of chat and stuff remember music is the healer and the doctor Please take care, keep spinning those discs, and I shall see you all very, very soon.